Welcome to Policy on Demand. I'm Sindhu Bloom. And I'm Scott McCandless. Like many of you around the United States, we were off for the Labor Day holiday and are coming to you on Tuesday, September 5th, with, as you can see, a new look and feel. That's right, Scott. A new season and a new wardrobe for our set. And we are so happy to be back and kicking off September with Janice Mays in the studio and Chairman Dave Camp joining us from Michigan. Welcome to you both. Well, thank you. Thanks for having both of us here. So I have want to start off with a question for both of you. With August recess behind us and Congress heading into what is going to be probably a busy fall session, could you provide your overarching thoughts on what you see unfolding in Washington for the remainder of the calendar year? Chairman Camp, let me start with you. Well, thanks, Sindhu. You know, it's going to be a busy, intense fall, as you mentioned, I think with an emphasis on the appropriations process and, you know, potentially a loon, looming government shutdown. I think that the unknown here is, do these investigations of the current administration and do the current legal issues for the prior administration kind of seep into what's going on and cause things to slow down a bit? I think by the end of the year, they'll figure out how to govern. Okay, thanks. Chairman Kemp, you had mentioned the prospect of a government shutdown and the appropriations process. Can you talk a little bit about where those negotiations stand and perhaps if we do have a government shutdown, just how protracted it might possibly be? Well, Scott, you have to go back and look at this agreement on uh, raising the debt limit, uh, but the fiscal year ends October 1st and the House and Senate are only in session 11 days in September. So uh, the speaker has said that's not enough time in order to fund the government by the October 1 deadline. And so what I, I think you'll see is a debate around a continuing resolution or continuing funding the government. But what you've seen is uh, a narrow group of Republicans have said they are not going to do a CR or continuing resolution into December. They want it shorter because they don't want to be backed up against the, the holiday. And they've made certain demands that they will not allow a CR to be at 2023 levels, which typically that is just an extension of current level funding. And they've also made some other demands about border wall funding and other issues as part of that. So I think you'll have to see, will the Republicans come together on the ability to pass in the House some sort of continuing resolution to allow uh, the Congress to, to fund the government without shutting the government down? Uh, now, some of this gets delayed because in that fiscal uh, agreement earlier I mentioned, uh, they said that if all the appropriations bills aren't passed by the end of the year, that there'll be a 1% across the board cut. So it looks like the, the deadline is January, but then again, those cuts won't be effective till April. So you could see this appropriations process potentially going even longer than the fall. All right, Janice, I want to come to you. The House Republicans have a bill um, in which there are a number of provisions that our viewers are very interested in, including R&D expensing, but not the child tax credit, which is what the Democrats want. So how do you see this playing out? What are the prospects for this bill? That package was basically the Republicans' first offer on an end of the year package. So it did have the three legacy tax increases from 2017. But the next step in this process, I see it as a three-step process. The chairs of the two committees need to negotiate out that child tax credit in a way that both sides feel they've won something. There's a work requirement. It's not as big as it was going to be by just Democrats, et cetera. But, and they can do that. That's very possible. Republicans originated the child tax credit. So they need to do that. And then they need to sell that package to both their caucuses right. as something that's reasonable and to sell it to leadership. They've got to convince leadership this needs to be done at the end of the year. So that's stage two. And then stage three, they search for a vehicle. How do they get it across the finish line? If all of this appropriation stuff's working out in December, that might be the vehicle. Another passed bill, must pass bill might be the vehicle. Otherwise, they do have a small, kind of a unicorn up on the Capitol Hill right now, a very popular bipartisan proposal to make certain there's no double taxation on investment in Taiwan and the US from Taiwan. Right. So, so they have a chance to find a vehicle to do this, but they first gotta solve the child tax credit problem. Chairman Camp, uh, Chairman Smith, and other members of the House Ways and Means Committee traveled to Europe to meet with the OECD and European representatives to express their concerns around Pillar 2. What outcomes might we expect to see as a result of these meetings? Well, it's been pretty clear, Scott, that Republicans haven't been very happy with this whole OECD process for quite some time, but they've really focused on the UTPR or the ability of the U.S. income of U.S. multinationals to be taxed. 
And they've been putting pressure on this on the OECD. Uh, have even passed a bill that eliminated funding, U.S. funding for the OECD. Uh, and and they feel like they did get some sort of victories. And at least uh, the recently announced uh, safe harbors, uh, particularly one that dealt with uh, delaying the UTPR in, in countries that had a, a corporate rate of at least 20%, which was clearly the U.S. Uh, well, that was kind of a short-term victory. Uh, I think they look at that as really seeing that the pressure really had some sort of effect. And then you also had more favorable treatment of, of tax credits, particularly those energy credits in the IRA. So I, I think this is really about how can they address particularly the UTPR. That seems to be the singular focus of where at least the Republicans in the House are uh, with regard to the OECD process. And I think that there probably needs to be uh, a, a longer fix to this idea that the U.S. income of U.S. multinationals can be taxed by others. And finally, Janice, as we head into this busy fall session that we just described, could you give some advice to companies as to what they might consider doing on both domestic and international tax policy? Probably sound like Johnny Two Note here, <laughs> but I have my same <laughs> issues. If you care about Section 174 or 163J or bonus depreciation, stay engaged with Congress. Sure. This is just a difficult year to get anything done. And so you need to make it important for the Congress to do this by the end of the year, that's first. And then with regard to the OECD and worldwide minimum tax, be getting ready. There's a lot you're gonna have to do, one, just in your own internal planning, but two, getting ready for compliance and all of these other tough issues. So you've got a lot of analysis to work on. Janice, it's terrific insight as always. Thank you very much for being with us. Chairman Camp, thank you as well. Appreciate your time. Thank you, great to be here. Thanks a lot. And for our viewers, please note that Week in Review returns on Friday and you won't want to miss it. And thank you as always for watching and stay with Policy On Demand for the latest developments in Washington and around the world. Take care.